Alrighty, hello everybody. My name is Marianne Bolas and I am the Executive Director of Coptic Voice. Um, welcome to our YouTube channel. I have with me David Degner. He is a photographer, a journalist. Um, you can see his works everywhere from um, the New York Times to National Geography, which is where I found him when he did an amazing expose on the mysticism of Egyptian culture. So welcome, David. Thank you. No, thanks for giving me a chance to talk to you about it. Yes, absolutely. So why don't we start with, why, just introduce yourself to us. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, why did you come to Love Egypt? How and what was your experience there like? Sure. Um, so. My name is David. Uh, I'm a photojournalist, um, studied in the US, worked at a few newspapers in the US. Um, and then I always got into photojournalism because uh, I knew, like, because 9-11 um, happened while I was in uh, high school and watching the US go to war in Iraq while I was in college, I saw how ignorant Americans are of the Middle East and uh, Islam and the uh, like diversity in the Middle East. Um, so I kind of always knew that I wanted, and I also my own ignorance, like I wanted to stop being so stupid about um, uh, the Middle East. So I always knew that I wanted to work my way eventually over to, uh, to somewhere in the Middle East. And I chose Egypt. Um, because it was like in 2009, it was cheap, centrally located, stable, relatively like to many other places uh, uh, in the Middle East. And that all kind of changed uh, in 2010 when the revolution started. And um, from then on, it was just a... Uh, It's hard for me to explain even now, like, <laughs> because it's, it's an overwhelming experience of what the country went through um, and being in the middle of that for like eight, nine years. Um, so I was there from the days when I'm in Noor, ran for president and lost uh, to like throughout the revolution and uh, up until CC came to power and um, the current, I left uh, about two years ago. Um, and within that time, I worked around the Middle East, but mainly I focused on Egypt. It's the place where I uh, became comfortable, really, like as much as um, I will always be a foreigner there. It became a place where I could like understand and crack jokes uh, that would, people would accept me mm -hmm. after a little while. Mm -hmm. um, That's great. Um, what was your transition like coming back to America two years ago? Um, so scary and that we I came back to the US uh, when Trump was um, in uh, still in power and he sounded a lot like many of the um, strongman dictators that I had been following in the Middle East sounded like mm. um, his constant constant attacks on the press his constant uh, attacks on uh, people that were different than him, people that might have different backgrounds or different beliefs, or mm -hmm. people that scapegoating of foreigners. Um, I mean, there were so many parallels from what I saw and seeing how divisive or divided the US was really reminded me of a lot of parts of the, mm -hmm. a lot of the stories that I've covered in the Middle East, whether it's Shias and Sunnis in Bahrain or um, like 
Syria just fracturing or Egypt and the like similar 50-50 split that was in the um, the Morsi when Morsi came to power. Um, that and how that ended with a massacre in Rabah was like frightening to see here. Yes. See like the parallels here and where that could go. But um, yeah, so when I came back to the US, I came more for my own uh, mental health and <laughs> it didn't help much in some <laughs> ways. Yeah, we're still on this planet. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yes, I totally agree. Um, you know, so I will put your um, photo um, essay onto the YouTube notes for anyone who wants to see it. But uh, for those who, of you who don't know, David wrote while he was in Egypt, he actually heard a lot about the mystical elements of Egyptian culture, all the things that we hear on a day to day basis, all of you, you know, Egypt is very unique in terms of the miracles that come in and out. I mean, I, I was telling David yesterday, I could speak to him for hours about every miracle I've ever heard, both within my own immediate family versus me, as well as my cousins and my cousin's friends and my friend's friends and my abunas. Um, and he got wind of that, he actually picked up on that. And so while he was in Egypt, he actually would try to find the source of these miracles and try to document them, take pictures of them, essentially trying to capture spirituality within a photo. And I think he did it very, very well. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I, was, I felt compelled to reach out to you is because of how well you picked up on it. Um, it's something I've always been aware of, at least on a subconscious level. Um, so that brings me to my second question, which is, what made you notice our mythical and our mystical culture and what motivated you to capture it on camera? Um, I think the first time that I really, like the event that really caught my eye was um, during the, by now it's, it's all like five or six years old, so my timeline might be a little messed up, but during the, um, I believe it was soon after the uh, the massacre of Rabbah and Sisi came to power. There was a little story that I heard uh, in in Matareya that a at a small church there a um, uh, painting of uh, the Mother Mary uh, started crying oil and. That's like a story that I've heard many times, but the thing that really interested me is that like two days after I saw that story, I saw another story that the military came and uh, took the painting for safekeeping. And that just like opened up so many questions about like, what, what power does this painting really have politically at this like very um, uh, fragile moment that first, it comes as a sign and second that the military wants to hide it. Um, hmm. And so I, yeah, just after that, I started remembering previous um, miracles that I had heard of and just kept a list. Um, eventually that list grew to like 50 or 60. And often it was, like Fulan Fulan heard from his uncle that <laughs> something happened and I didn't have exact contact information for any of this. It was just like, I heard someone say something and um, that also, like the very first photo I got was actually um, uh, January 25th uh, during the first day of the revolution when um, I was in this in Tahrir Square and had spent all day like photographing and going in and out sending photos. Um, and then at about midnight, the uh, police pushed from the south from Ogama uh, through the square, and one of their um, tear gas canisters landed in a bush. And even though we were all like 
running out of the square, just trying to get away from the oncoming uh, police charge. Uh, I was like mesmerized by this burning bush because yeah, but like a burning bush that happened in Egypt um, in Moses's time was like symbolically there in front of me. And in photography, we can be um, like a bit obsessed with symbolism and using like subtlety. And that was just like a, uh, this little miracle that happened at the very start of the revolution. And I, like, I loved it. It's just like this one little photo that I took that I really liked. That is oh. so beautiful. That's and I did, and the photo <laughs> is on his, um, on his website. And it, 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 I remember thinking, oh, I, I didn't even connect that. Actually, the story of the burning bush is takes place in Egypt. But yeah, yeah that's that's another point to it. It um, this like in so many places, miracles are very immediate. But there is some something like intergenerational about the miracles in Egypt that they just keep reoccurring, and they have similar miracles have occurred for so long. I, I just liked that to start with. Yes. Um, and then sometimes I feel like there are stories that are just um, way out of left field. Uh, one of the ones that I thought was really funny in your, essay, in your essay was about the flying cat that you found that you played detective trying to get to the bottom of. Um, can you share, share what happened, your, the story, your experience trying to get to the bottom of it and, what ha and, and the aftermath? Sure. Yeah, I'll try to. Um, I'll try to tell you. Uh, <laughs> the um, it started after I like after I'd started doing more research about miracles. I started down a rabbit hole on YouTube, uh, looking at just type in Moageza in uh, in YouTube, and you get a large, very interesting set of photo of videos. And one of them that I came across was of um, a family at their very simple kitchen table um, huddled around a cat um, with, and they were like turning it around and talking about it. And uh, the, the title was something like Miracle Cat with uh, Wings. And that got me interested and it was like, <laughs> Um, so I eventually contacted the, uh, the videographer that shot the original video, mm -hmm. uh, Hany, I believe was his name in Port Said. Uh, and when I was up in Port Said for another, I was up there for another story, but anyways, I went to, um, Port Said and decided, oh, it's, uh, I'd love to see this, this cat. Um, unfortunately, Hanny was not responding to me anymore. He just kind of fell off the edge of the, the map, as sometimes happens. Mm -hmm. And so all I could go on was the caption information under the um, video. And now I forget the details, but the, it was something like they were definitely Christian. I could tell from the, the video they were the caption mentioned the um the neighborhood that they were lived in mm -hmm. and their name like the name of the father mm -hmm. uh so i i decided that's just the next neighborhood over i'll go as we all know there's like a limited number of churches in many neighborhoods so i'll take a a few hours go around to all the churches and ask mm -hmm. for um the, the father's name and so I start pretty early in the morning, go to the first church, nothing. They point me to the next church, go to the next church, nothing. And I keep going through to like five or six churches. Um, and it's getting late. No one seems to know uh, of the father or has heard of this cat, which kind of surprised me, but... Um, then that first church, I'd never really gotten to talk with anyone beyond the uh, the guard at the door. So I decided to return back to it and ask, um, try to like talk with a uh, father or someone that would know more people in the church. And when I returned back, there's more guards at the door by that time later in the afternoon. 
And one of them says, oh, yeah, Dal and I, like, come with me. And um, so I get a little excited and start walking with him. And we go out and we, like, walk. And he walks me into the police station. Oh, God. Where I um, then he starts explaining to the police that, hey, there's this random foreigner walking around asking for a cat with wings. <laughs> uh, which the police then become interested in and they uh they start questioning me a little bit and then eventually they say uh have a seat here and after a little while they take me up to the uh the officer that's up uh, like on the third floor he's got a the one nice air conditioned room in this like sweltering hot police station. <laughs> I was kind of happy to be ushered in. Yeah. Um, there was a, another man, the officer was busy yelling at, just like kind of big guy in just his underwear, the vanilla. <laughs> but, and uh, yeah, I couldn't quite get what he was yelling about, but it seemed, uh, seemed to have to do with drugs or something. But eventually he finishes yelling at that man um and sends him out and then he welcomes me over and starts talking with me about um what i'm there looking for he's an older gruff officer doesn't really smile or anything just kind of takes the news of cat with wings in his district very matter of factly <laughs> uh, says okay um go wait in the other office uh, so I, I can't really do anything else. I'm not arrested, but I'm not free. Yeah. So I go wait in the other office. And I spend a lot of that time talking with the other officers. Mm -hmm. And this is the thing that kind of surprised me that like, these are the eyes and ears of the government on the ground there. And none of them had heard of this cat with wings that's in their district. Like how am I barking up the wrong tree? What's, maybe it doesn't exist. Um, but eventually it starts getting late. I'm like texting all the other journalists. I know that, Hey, I'm in a police station. This is the exact one. If I don't get out tonight, come look for me here. Um, but eventually, uh, a nice guy in a suit walks in, uh, doesn't match the other officers at all. He's from the Daula and he like speaks perfect english and takes me out to another room to start an interview um and yeah he interviews me for what's well, probably one of the more like interesting uh reports in my folder in central security or state security mm -hmm. um so and in the end he's like okay you're free to go no problems but by that time, it's also like so late that I just kind of give up my search and go yeah. back to the hotel. And um, yeah, I figured I went to all the churches. No one knows that. No one knows um, of this cat with wings. Ask the police. No one knows of this cat. Uh, or, so I figured the next day, uh, head back, get on a bus and head back to Cairo. But as I'm in the taxi going back to the um the bus station of course and just like chatting with the taxi driver and mm -hmm. got to tell him my new story of mm -hmm. ending up in the police station but he says ah you you went to all the coptic churches but you didn't go to the episcopal church or sorry evangelical church yeah um and i was like ah, oh, there's a evangelical church there okay yeah and he, he knew the owner of a t the tire uh store was like one of the big men in the church so he just dropped me off there instead of like even going to the church and then that um owner uh said oh yeah yeah i know uh the father and i've kind of heard this cat with wings like, just get on this motorcycle with uh my assistant and he'll take you back and find the, the right guy and yeah, they, they did. Um, the, we found uh, the father's house. Um, unfortunately, he was off at work at that time, but his neighbor 
had his phone number. So I took his number and called him up and uh, like, as just started explaining, I'm a journalist, I heard he had a cat with wings. Can you tell me about him? And um, the, so he started saying, well, this cat came like soon after Cece came to power, it appeared. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was kind of like in the video, the family kind of linked them with, um, uh, as a sign about CC coming in and being a blessing. Mm -hmm. um, but then for other reasons, it sounded like they couldn't tell if the cat was uh, like from God or from the devil. So they cut off the cat's wings and let it go. And How convenient. Yeah. Or yeah. I have to say inconvenient for you. I know, I can't even see it. Yeah. I guess the real moral of the story is that taxi drivers are the real ears and eyes. That's very true. Yeah. Taxi drivers know everything like compared to anyone else. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so true. Um, yeah, I just thought that story was really funny that right when you finally, finally found the source, they said, oh, we, you know, we clipped its wings and now it's just a normal cat. You'll never yeah. find it again. Um, what about your story with the Blessed Water, which I think is a more, maybe a more traditional Coptic story? Mm -hmm. um, I think, are you referring to the one with the photo of the leg, the guy washing his leg? Um, yeah. Or I think there were, there were several Blessed Water stories that I found. In fact, I think I, um, I kind of conflate two or three three of them in my project. Um, one of them was uh, at the, uh, I believe it was Kanisa Maharak uh, in Babizuela. Mm -hmm. I think it was Babizuela, the neighborhood. The, the mountain church, the one that's in the cave? Uh, uh, no, no, not that one. Um, it's near uh, Al Hussein and the neighborhood. It's a neighborhood that Ayman Noor used to be a representative of. That is where the Baba, Baba, I believe. Sorry. I'll take your word for so, it. I, I, my Egyptian yeah, geography is really bad. So. Yeah, me too. Now it's unfortunately. <laughs> um, but anyways, so at this church, um, I'd heard about this church and how it's one of the many places yeah, where the Holy Family stopped on their uh, trip through um, through Egypt. So many people go there searching for blessings. And uh, while I was there, I, I noticed an older man come in and he started washing his leg in some of the, um, the water that was fed by a natural spring underneath the church. Mm -hmm. And so I talked with him and he... Uh, had a a little store beside the church, and he came every day. Um, or he used to actually be a taxi driver, but his uh, he got a tumor or cancer in his leg, and that made it impossible for him to drive. So he got a um, a little store selling um, like beads uh and things to make decorations out of uh and it happened to be beside this church so every day while he was um there working he would make a little trip to the church wash his leg in the holy water and after a few months he found that his um his leg was healed that it wow. the he no longer had pain in it. And he went to several doctors. He said he went to six doctors to get wow. um, uh, diagnosed, like what happened to his leg. Uh, in previous x-rays, there had been a tumor or cancer, and now there were, was none. Um, sorry, it wasn't, it was a clot, it was a blood clot. Yeah. Um, and now there was none, and his leg was much better. Um, yeah, so that's like, a story that I ran across similar, I ran across similar stories quite a bit. Um, 
but the I also liked that there was a um, in Upper Egypt there was a small village called uh, Esna Adir, and in this small village there was a, um, a sheikh who was like ninety eight years old and he'd been uh, teaching children in his house for a long time. He was uh, Hafiz, um, and he was seen as a very um, holy person in that village, and especially for all of the teaching they had done. And um, so people would come to his house at all times. Like I just happened to go there one random like Tuesday afternoon. Mm -hmm. And while I was sitting in the living room, there were three or four groups of people that would come and they would pray beside him. And uh, he, he was so old, like at 98, that he didn't really move or anything. He was just... Yeah. Uh, lying in his bed and his daughters picked up the um, responsibility of praying with people and they one of the things that they continued to do was take uh, water from the uh, barrel uh, in front of their house and they would pray on it uh, as a blessing and give it to the visitors and this idea of like some power being in water or a power being like transmittable from one physical location to another physical location. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, yeah, kind of a universal theme that I saw in many places. Yeah, that actually feeds into my second question, which is um, as from our conversation yesterday that there seems to be motifs, common motifs, common symbols, common stories even, um, that are threaded throughout all of our stories uh, for both Muslims and Copts, some that are, you know, uniquely Coptic, some that are uniquely um, Islamic, but also a lot of interweaving as well. So I think water was an absolutely great example. Were there any other common stories, for example, that are shared, like, you know, like the um, story of St. Mary appearing in Zaytun that was seen by a mass number of people, including my dad, as I told you. Um, and also, what are some other common mystical symbols that you noticed while you were in Egypt? Um, there's definitely uh, like similar similarities or common themes, whether it's blessed water or like yesterday, blessed trees yes. um, that, yeah, probably are, it's so unusual to see an old tree in Egypt that when you see one, it just like jumps out. So there must be something special happening yeah. here um, to blessed places whether it's um, uh, things like Mulid, Mulid's uh, Jablatir or Dranka or Abu Hasna Shazli in places that people go on a pilgrimage to uh, both as an escape from the, the monotony of uh, normal life and also as a place to go ask for blessings. Um, and you would see that one of my favorite was uh, a place called uh, Sabah Benet and I believe it's outside of Minia. I forgot now but um, yeah it's just a, a large empty field of dirt where people come on the weekend and they set up a barbecue off to the side and the kids go roll in the dirt for blessings and uh, that's a good weekend. Um, and like, I heard one thing that I'm kind of sad that I came to this so late is that I heard of similar things happening, uh, in more places just 10, 20 years ago. Uh, like there used to be one, uh, up above, uh, Mukatam, mm -hmm. uh, where there's a rock rocks that people would visit and that's completely wiped out as a new housing development. Oh. Um, and there's definite moves in the, um, in the Muslim authorities or, um, Islamic institutions to kind of 
downplay and suppress these types of um, mystic practices, mm. uh, whether it's denying them, calling them Shia, calling them like uh, Shuruk of one, one sort or another. Um, while I found in, in the church, it's kind of the other way uh, quite often where they are collected in books and sold in the church bookstore and um, spread on a very official, in an in official manner. But not like unofficially on all sides, they're just like psh, spread unofficially through, yeah. as you see, Facebook and okay. friends and mm -hmm. like stories that everyone knows. Um, yeah, it, it's a, it really is something that permeates uh, large parts of Egyptian life. Yeah, um, yeah. There's, if someone, really, if anyone really wants to read a great book on this, uh, there's a book called Living with Jinn, written by a, a great um, academic scholar, and I forgot her name, but if you search for Living with Jinn, we'll find it. Um, Good to know. I will also link that in um, the notes as well. So people can take a look. Cool. Yeah. Um, and you know, I think it's also interesting that you were studying mysticism in Egypt at a time that coincided with some of the most tumultuous moments, tumultu tumultuous moments in modern day Egypt. Um, like, you know, you were there, you told me yesterday that there was a point where you had gone to so many church bombings that it was not like body numbing and mind numbing. Um, you yeah. know, that you were there for the Mespero massacre. You were in Tahrir Square when Tahrir happened. Um, yeah. You know, you were there when the 21 um, uh, martyrs of Libya were killed on television. You were just through all of it. Um, did that affect your sense of spirituality? And do you think it also affected your research and your photography of, of, of looking into mysticism? And um, how so? Um, it probably affected my understanding of spirituality in the way that like, I, I'm lucky I live like a pretty privileged life of like having stability and backups of backups of resources that mm -hmm. um, I'm not rich by any stretch of the imagination, but I'm, I'm never going to like, hopefully never going to be like starving on the street anytime soon or like have loved one, loved ones killed um, just like immediately without any um, warning. Mm -hmm. And when I spent so much time talking with people who had suffered from uh, the economic hardships or the like traumas of these massive upheavals that we talk about in political terms, but have very real implications on individuals' lives yes. on the ground. Yeah. Like, man, I would be, yeah, a lot more sympathy for people that um, find solace in spirituality and look for answers to their very real problems and miracles and like if you can't believe that the that there's any justice in the government or any justice in uh in any of these like family institutions or and then you look for justice and help in other places and, and sp spirituality is one of those places where so a lot of people find it and um if yeah and mysticism is a big place to find hope um yeah yeah i would even wager to say that maybe the if there's any truth to these miracles at all and why they happen so often in places like egypt more so than america maybe it's because of the fact that they need it more because that threat is ever looming. Yeah. Maybe. Um, well, finally, I have one last question for you. Um, Egypt is a very old country. That's one of the things we are very proud of, of is how old we are. 
Um, my mom always makes fun of me whenever I go to England and I'm like, mom, Westminster Abbey is 500 years old. She's like, that's a joke. That's, that's a baby yeah. age, you know, try the pyramids, Mary. <laughs> um, yeah, that's, exactly. that's how proud we are of our, of our age. Um, and it's played many major roles in a lot of world history. You know, we played major, a major role throughout the Bible, both as villains and as heroes. Um, you know, we played a, a major role in, um, you know, even in modern day with the Arab Spring. Has its ancientness played a significant role in your life, living there for eight years in relationship with the spiritual world and the mystical world, and how so? Um, I think the... So I'll start with, um, I, I studied at a, a Christian school uh, in the US. And when we were taught about Christianity, uh, it was very much a, um, a bit detached. Like these stories that we're hearing about all happened way over there a long time ago. Mm -hmm. um, we have no direct visual or like, uh, family history with those things, even though um, Christians here believe just as much. It, there's there's some like physical and temporal detachment that occurs mm -hmm. when you um, understand religion from here. And I could see that uh, in Egypt and throughout the Middle East, there is no like temporal or distant detachment between religion, like the Holy Family came through Egypt, stopped at these places that are in Matareya and in like Zaytun, like so many um, neighborhoods just have like a little shrines to uh, the Holy Family or sheikhs or um, parts of history that are just like left in corners of streets. And that... Um, that helped cement the idea of the importance of history and how it like, sometimes we never get past it. It's hard to get past it. Um, but the, the other aspect is like, when looking at these miracles, there is a generational aspect to it that we might not see Many outsiders might not see it at first glance. We think um, a miracle that happened uh, in the Bible or the Quran is something separate and completely different than a miracle that happened today. But there's uh, physical, often physical and like emotional and family lines that tie them all together, whether you're talking about the um, like. Uh, yeah, so many locations in Egypt that are very definitely tied with uh, historical events to um, uh, the authority that these institutions have, whether it's Al Azhar or the church, because like the, the church is the best example of it, how it claims to be the like oldest. Uh, one of the oldest churches in Christianity and like that gives it more authority than other churches. Um, yeah, there, this is like a very real uh, part of how Egyptians see themselves and how it, um, how they live their like daily lives. Often, yes. yeah, often like, talk with anyone, <laughs> talk with any young Egyptian and they'll, one of the like fourth question I'll ask is, have, have you been to the pyramids? And because they're very proud of it. Yes. They might not have been, but they're very proud of like their pharaonic history being so close. Yes, even us here in America, when someone tells me they've been to Egypt, I'm like, I hope you visited the pyramids. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Definitely a top 10 place to visit before you die. But no, I mean, <laughs> 
I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something that's unpopular, but <laughs> the pharaonic history of Egypt is the most overrated <laughs> part of Egypt. It is the, you might have to cut this from the video. Yeah, so folks, that's it for today. So, <laughs> Just kidding. so many other beautiful parts of Egypt that like don't get seen because we've got to go look at some old rocks that are like piled up in Luxor. And there are like so many other parts of Luxor that are beautiful and amazing and like complex. And like, sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. You know that you have, you're an artist. You have an artist eye. I'm going, you know, I'm going for the common denominator. Okay. You know? Which is people want to see rocks, but put on top of each other into you know, yeah, triangle in a form. <laughs> pyramid. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. that's really funny. Okay, well, thank you so much. Um, I oh, really, I really appreciate you coming. So I will be putting on um, that link to that book as well as the um, link to your article on Nat Geo. And yeah, I, I hope you have a great rest of your night. No, thanks for talking with me. It's been, uh, it's always fun to talk about my work and about Egypt in general. It's like, I, I miss it. I need to get back sometime soon. Soon, soon. Okay. All righty.